I've never seen anything as powerful as showing somebody their brain, like with addiction. Mm. When I first started ordering scans, I was the director of a dual diagnosis unit, so a psychiatric hospital unit that takes care of substance abusers. Their brains were so bad. <laughs> and I was like, here's a healthy brain, here's your brain. Your brain controls everything you do. Which brain do you want? I mean, I think anybody with an addiction should get their brain scanned. And I came up with, I wrote a book with uh, David Smith called Unchain Your Brain, Breaking the Addictions That Steal Your Life. And like giving everybody Prozac's insane, right? There are many different ways to get depressed. Give everybody a 12-step program. It's a bit insane because they're impulsive addicts. They're compulsive addicts. They're impulsive compulsive addicts. They're sad addicts. They're head trauma addicts. It's like, no, the type you had. And if somebody diagnosed you with ADD, which we will talk about, well, that's our impulsive addicts group. It's like mm. you want to do the right things, but you just don't have enough of a break to stop. And that could go with low frontal lobe activity. Our compulsive addicts, they just get the same thought in their head over and over again. And sometimes clinically, it's hard to tell the difference because they go, oh, I'm impulsive. But what they really mean is they're compulsive. So they get a thought. The impulsive person gets a thought and does it without thinking. The compulsive person gets a thought over and over again and has to do it. And so one is a dopamine intervention, the other is a serotonin intervention. And how would you know unless you really looked? Interesting. A little over a year ago, I did a week-long intensive therapeutic process that was intended to be trauma-oriented, childhood trauma-oriented, and it was, it was incredible. And over the course of that week, I spent time with a wide variety of psychiatrists. And at the end of that week, there was a consensus among all of these psychiatrists that I had ADHD. As I said at the beginning, that was news to me uh, because I had always thought of this as a condition associated with hyperactivity. I was not a hyperactive kid. I didn't feel like I had any of the symptomology that, at least in my mind, was associated with that condition. But through the process of, of being diagnosed and, and kind of working through it, I've developed a whole new perspective on this. And I realized the extent to which I developed coping strategies to deal with this that allowed me to kind of overcome that predisposition, I would have never known. I just didn't think that I was, you know, that person. Swimming, I'll treat it. Yeah. That's how I did it. I would just exhaust myself through exercise and then I could calm down and sit. So I didn't have that experience of not being able to focus because the exercise gave me a different baseline. So can I talk about the five hallmark symptoms of ADD and you yeah. tell me which ones you have? I mean, there are more. The diagnostic criteria includes 18, but I think of one, it's short attention span, but not for everything. It's short attention span for regular routine everyday things, schoolwork, homework, paperwork, chores, for things that are new, novel, highly stimulating, or frightening, people with ADD can pay attention just fine because they have their own intrinsic dopamine. Love is a drug, especially new love is a dopamine drug. So if you love your teacher, we're going to want to please them. And so you do fine in that class but your attention span is erratic and that's what fools people because they're like no but i'm interested i heard president george w bush say this and he said no i did well in the classes i was interested in and i'm like not another add president right we just came off of bill clinton who clearly had impulse control issues so does that resonate with you sure the things that I'm interested in, I can be completely obsessed by. The things I'm not interested in uh, are more challenging. But to me, that just isn't that everybody. And I think in reflecting on that, like I've made some pretty big life decisions about career in the past where I was choosing a career path that, that really wasn't what I should have been doing. And I have a huge capacity for persevering and determination. And I could force myself to 
you know, do the work that I wasn't interested in. Um, but it becomes very exhausting. And I, I was a lawyer for a long time and I have many memories of being in the law firm and trying to force myself to write these briefs and motions and do discovery and all the stuff that you do as a litigator and looking around and, and realizing that my colleagues seem much more interested in this than me. And I just thought everybody was suffering through this in the same way that I was rather than the truth, which was I was this round peg trying to jam myself into a square hole. Yeah, that you didn't love it. And if you have ADD, one of the things I tell all my ADD patients is find something you love that you can make money at, right? I mean, too often people go, oh, find things you love that you're then dependent on other people. Mm -hmm. That's a prescription for misery. The second symptom is distractibility. You see too much. You feel too much. You sense too much. It's like the world comes at you quickly. And so you want to sit down and read a book, but then you get distracted by the email or by your phone or because you're mm -hmm. hungry or something. But also, isn't that everybody? No. My best friend in medical school had ADD. And I loved him dearly. He graduated top of our class. I was second. He was first. But he was my partner, so I was proud of him. And just so distracted and it was funny to sort of watch it. I don't feel like I'm a distracted person, but I do feel like I need to be doing one thing at a time. And as long as I just have this one thing that I'm doing, like I'm okay, I can focus, I can, even when I don't feel like, like doing it, I can kind of overcome that, override it and do it. Where I get into trouble is when I wake up and now my life is very full, there's lots of things happening and I start to think about all the things that I have to do and it becomes very overwhelming very quickly and I get stressed and anxious and that gets translated into just being an aggravated person and you know being unpleasant to be around. But it left to my own devices, if I can just, I like to go all in on one thing, disappear, complete it, and then I'm open for the next thing. The third one is organization. It's hard for people who have ADD organization for time and space. Now, I think there are seven different types of ADD. I was going to say, what's the difference between ADD, ADHD? What are we talking about? Well, I think there's seven types. That's what I learned from Imogene. But ADD, attention deficit disorder, was a name given to this thing. It used to be called minimal brain dysfunction before then by the American Psychiatric Association with DSM-3, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 1980. That's what I trained on. 1987, for God knows what reason, they changed the name to ADHD. So it used to be ADD with hyperactivity mm -hmm. or ADD without hyperactivity. And they changed the name to ADHD to sort of lump everybody together. The problem is half the people who have this disorder are never hyperactive. And so it was very confusing. And then 1994, they changed the name again to AD slash HD, highlighting half the people who have this are never hyperactive. So, you know, the names are not scientific. Let's just be super clear about this. There's no biology to this. A group of psychiatrists get together and they vote based on what they think the best evidence is. And often it's sort of silly. Like we lost Asperger's this time. Everybody now, whether you're Elon Musk and high functioning autistic gets the same diagnosis as someone who's in a developmental center that can never live independently. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. bizarre. Mm -hmm. When I first started imaging, I'm like, oh, it's not one thing based on imaging. And if we look at your brain, I'll be able to tell you. So type one is classic ADHD, short attention span, distractibility, disorganized, for time and space, so we didn't talk much about that one, but your room, your desk, your book bag, trouble with organization. And you I'm might. I'm not that guy. I'm if sorry? anything, I'm OCD. So you might be type three. We'll get to that. People with ADD tend to be late or just right on time because they actually don't start getting ready to go until, oh my God, I'm late. 
That's not me either. Okay. I'm generally timely. This is why like, I want to go and get a brain. <laughs> brain so, I'm not convinced that so I have So one this. sort of, two, not that much. Uh-huh. The not being able to multitask is very male brain thing as opposed to an ADD thing. Disorganization, forest procrastination, you put things off, put things off, put things off. I do that. Until you're mad or somebody else is mad at you. Mm-hmm. And then five is impulse control. You say things you probably shouldn't say or do things probably shouldn't do. And it's like the break in your brain is vulnerable. And I think those are the five things. And if you have three out of five, you probably Mm. do have it. And it sounds like for you, somebody should look at your brain. Right. And what would you see? Was it the interrupting at the conference you went to or at the treatment you went to where all the psychiatrists says you have... ADD. The interrupting? What do you mean? Like, were you interrupting people in conversations or? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, why it, were they it saying wasn't that? that? Am I interrupting you now? Is that why no. you're saying that? I get accused of that on the podcast, interrupting people too much. If I was interrupting, they didn't tell me that I was. And if I was doing it, I was probably not consciously aware of doing it. So why did they want to drug you? What did they see that they went... Do you have ADHD? Probably related to to addiction issues, perhaps. I don't know. Or coping mechanisms that I've developed to focus or the way in which I can use excessive exercise to calm myself down. I'm not sure. Well, we'll look at it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how do we know unless we look? Right? It's like right. one of the themes I And what would you see by. in a brain scan of a brain with ADHD versus a healthy brain. So often healthy at rest and drops with concentration, especially in your prefrontal cortex, front third of your brain, an area called the basal ganglia where dopamine works and your cerebellum. So healthy at rest, drops when you concentrate, we need to fix that. And you can fix it with exercise. You can fix it with certain stimulating supplements. And sometimes medication can be incredibly helpful. But the problem is what I saw, because I'm a child psychiatrist and an adult psychiatrist, but part of half the patients we have at Amen Clinics have ADD of one form or another. And what I found, there's classic, short attention span, distractibility, hyperactivity, impulse control issues. There's inattentive ADD, never really hyperactive or terribly impulsive, but trouble performing, trouble with focus. I have a child with both of those types. Type three is over-focused ADD. The problem is not that you can't pay attention, it's you can't shift your attention. You end up to get stuck on things. Mm -hmm. And because you're organized, that tends to be the one exception is type three. But these people also tend to be argumentative, oppositional. If things don't go their way, they get upset and uh, they can hold on to grudges. And their addiction of choice tends to be things that calm their brain Mm -hmm. down, whether Mm -hmm. it's alcohol or marijuana. Mm -hmm. Type four is limbic ADD. Their emotional brain works too hard and they tend to see the world through dark glasses. They have the eight hallmark ADD traits plus sort of mild depression. Type five is temporal lobe. ADD, often from a head injury. One or both of their temporal lobes hurt, so mood instability, irritability, temper stuff. Uh, Six, I'm famous for, it's made it to movies. It's called The Ring of Fire, where the brain is not low in activity, it's high in activity. It's working way too hard, often due to inflammation. And type seven is anxious ADD. And it's their level of anxiety that gets them places on time, but they have to work so much harder than Mm. their colleagues. And all of these are rooted in genetics? Some is rooted in trauma, but ADD is very genetic, right? It's so genetic that if I see an ADHD child and I don't see it at all in their mom's side or their dad's side, I'm looking at the kid to see if he looks like 
their parents. I mean, it's literally that really? genetic. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I don't know if I could identify it in my in my family tree. I mean, I'm not qualified to. But it can also be caused by a concussion. And so, you know, if you come to see me, one of the things we're going to ask you five or six, seven, ten times, have you ever had a brain injury? Mm -hmm. Have you ever fallen out of a tree off a fence, dove into a shallow pool? Have you ever had a concussion playing sports, a car accident? I look forward to getting my brain scanned. It'll be super interesting. You'll have me, right? We can do this? I'm so excited. Yeah, good. Let's talk about raising mentally strong kids. I apologize. You just handed me this book. I haven't read it yet. So perhaps you can kind of give us the thesis, like why did you write this book and what is it that you're trying to say here? So children are at the worst in recorded history as far as mental health problems, the levels of anxiety, depression, ADHD, self-harming behaviors is out of control. Brand new study, 54% of teenage girls report being persistently sad. 32% have thought of killing themselves, 24% have planned to kill themselves, and 13% have tried to kill themselves. Schools are overwhelmed by the incidence of kids on medication and the kids suffering with panic attacks and other mental health problems. It's awful what's happening. And what I learned really early in my career is the most effective intervention to raise mentally healthy kids is parenting strategies. And the first one, obviously, if you want mentally healthy children, you have to be mentally strong yourself. I talk about how important that is. And then there's this system that I've become attached to that I just think is so effective. And I wrote the book with my friend, Dr. Charles Fay, who's the president of the Love and Logic Institute. And that program is actually very important to me personally, because when we brought that into our home, it just became so much happier. And so in the book, we mixed neuroscience and the program I've been using for years with love and logic. So we combine these two programs to really do what we think of as the latest innovations in parenting. Every parent wants mentally strong kids. We want our kids to be confident, kind, responsible, all of these things. And obviously, kids intuit how you're behaving. That's much more important than what's coming out of your mouth. If, you're, if your behavior doesn't match you know, what you're saying, they're paying attention to the behavior much more than the words. Um, but where, you know, where are even the best intentions going wrong. I mean, the statistics that you, you quoted are devastating. There's a lot of things contributing to that, of course, but where is it where we think we're doing the right thing and perhaps we're misguided? We're rescuing children way too much. We're solving their problems because of our low self-esteem. And I'm guilty of this, I think, for the first three. And, and I love all my children. And if you don't feel really great about yourself, you get self-esteem by doing for your children when they could do sure. for themselves. And then what you do is you create incompetent people. So when a child comes to you and says, I'm bored, too often parents then scramble to get them the latest video game or take them someplace rather than just give them the problem back. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wonder what you're going to do about that. And then be loving enough to not fix it. So my wife and Chloe, our 20-year-old, when she was six, seven, they'd have these monster homework battles. And I'm a child psychiatrist, and I look at Tana and, and go, you've done second grade. Get out of this fight. She wouldn't listen to me. So, but three of her friends recommended parenting with love and logic. And that's the foundational principle. Let kids solve their own problems. I mean, be a good coach, be a resource. Don't 
solve it. And so when Tana really understood it, she announced to Chloe, sweetheart, I've done second grade. I'm never ever again going to ask you to do your homework. Mm. It's on you. And if you don't do it, you just have to be okay with the consequences. And Chloe had a fit and said, I never said I was going to do my homework. I'm just not going to do it now. Stormed off. Came back 20 minutes later. She's now a junior or a Chapman. No one's ever asked her to do her homework again. And she had a 4.2 out of high school. She's responsible. She's competent and can solve her own problems. We go wrong when we steal their self-esteem by solving their problems. So, for example, Chloe knew it. If she forgot her homework, nobody's bringing it to her. If she forgot her sweater on a cold day, nobody's bringing it to her. Um, if she forgot her lunch, it takes 24 hours to starve. Nobody's bringing <laughs> it to her. And she only forgot those things like twice. And now she doesn't forget you anything. Learn the lesson. Yeah, you become self-directed. You develop that self-efficacy that will serve you later in life. Self-esteem comes from performing esteemable acts on behalf of yourself. And if you're always rushing in to solve the problem or rescue, you're depriving your child of the opportunity to learn those things. Right. It's a short-term gain, long-term pain situation. Right. And it's I think a lot love. of time-crunched parents are like, okay, let me just solve the problem because I just, you know, I have other things to do and I can fix this rather than allow the child to scramble and mess up and figure it out on their own because sometimes that's not convenient. Right. And it's also not goal-directed. So principle number one is know what you want. What kind of parent do you want to be? And what kind of child do you want to raise? Ask yourself that question. Ask the other parent that question. What kind of parents do we want to be and what kind of child do we want to raise? Because then your behavior stems from whatever mission statement you create. And then the second thing is attachment. It's bonding. And that requires two things. Time. Actual physical time. And listening. Parents talk way too much. And we have all this great knowledge and all these great experiences. We just want to pour it into their little heads. And they tune us out. Mm -hmm. If you do active listening with them, they'll be so close to you but if you tell them how to think and you interrupt them it's very bad for the relationship for the attachment and then i have an exercise in the book that's just gold i mean it works it's worked every time i think parents who actually do it the way i ask is 20 minutes a day with the kid do something with them they want to do and during that time, no commands, no questions, no direction. Mm -hmm. And when I first figured it out, and then I just saw it work, and it worked, and it worked. My literary agent uh, at the time, Carl, he called me up and he said, I'm having trouble with my two-year-old. So he had a child later in life, and Laura was two, and she's like, she never wants anything to do with me. And I'm like, you're ignoring her. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, do this. And I told him special time, 20 minutes a day, do something with her that she wants to do, which means basically sit on the floor and play with her blocks. And no questions, no commands, no directions. And he's like, that won't work. Uh, he tended to be oppositional. And I'm like, oh, great, you represent an idiot. Mm -hmm. I said, you need to do this. I'm going to call you in three weeks, get the party started. And three weeks later, I called him up. And I'm like, hey, Carl, it's Daniel. Daniel, she won't leave me alone. All she wants to do is be with me. I, suit, I walk in the door. She grabs my leg. She wants her time. Right. Because isn't that what we all wanted? I mean, unless our parent was awful, we all wanted their attention. And, you know, I'm one of seven. So, you know, my mother had to be <laughs> judicious about how she did it. But because my dad was never home, we didn't have a relationship. And 1972, turned 18, he told me if I voted for McGovern, the country would go to hell. And because we didn't have a relationship, I voted for McGovern, and the country went to hell, but it had nothing to do with McGovern. It was because of Nixon and Watergate. 
And I like having influence with my kids, but there's no influence without connection. There's different kinds of attachment also. I think that's very wise and it's also very straightforward and doable, like invest your time in your children, be interested in what they're interested in. Uh, When they tell you something, don't lecture them or tell them why they're wrong. Just say, tell me more and be on their level where they don't feel judged or like you're going to, you know, basically explain something to them, right? I think that's great advice. On the opposite end of the spectrum from someone like your father is the very enmeshed parent. And that's a different kind of attachment disorder where they're overly invested in in their child's well-being and the child becomes a vehicle for their own self-esteem. Right. So they're projecting all of this emotional baggage on their child and the child then is shouldering this responsibility to make their parent feel okay and whether that projection is ambition or their own insecurities or their own dreams that were never realized the child on an unconscious level is is subsuming all of that and that you know becomes problematic no question i like to think of good parents like good coaches and I've been blessed to work with some amazing coaches and good coaches notice what you do right and they teach. Bad coaches notice what you do wrong and focus on it. And in the book, there's a whole section on why I collect penguins. So I have like 2,000 penguins. It's a little weird. Not real live penguins. No. Uh, penguin pens, cups, dolls, tie. I have a penguin weather rain, a penguin vacuum. It's bizarre. But my oldest child, Anton, who I adopted, he was hard for me. He was mm. argumentative, oppositional, things and go his way, got upset. And I talked to my supervisor, and she said, You need more one-on-one time with him. And I took him to a place called Sea Life Park, which is in Hawaii. It's on Oahu, sort of like Sea World. They had sea animal shows, and we had a great day. Whale show, sea lion show, dolphin show. And at the end of the day, I took him to the Fat Freddy show. He was a Humboldt penguin, chubby, but he's amazing. He climbed like a 20-foot diving board, went to the end, would bounce and jump in the water, bowled with his nose, countered with his flippers, jumped through a fire. And at the end of the show, the trainer asked him to go get something. He went and got it, and he brought it right back. And time stood still for me, because in my head, I'm like, damn, I asked my kid to get something, and he wants to have a discussion for like 20 minutes, Uh and then he doesn't want to do it. And I knew my son was smarter than the penguin and I realized I was the problem and so I went up to the trainer afterwards and I'm like how'd you get Freddie to do all these really cool things and she said unlike parents whenever Freddie does anything like what I want him to do I notice him I give him a hug and I give him a fish and the light went on in my head that when my son did like things I really liked I wasn't paying attention but when he didn't I gave him a lot of attention because mm-hmm. I didn't want to raise bad kids and I collect penguins as a way to remind myself every day I'm shaping the people around me by what I pay attention to that's interesting to. yeah so it's like this this totem to bring you back to that place that's cool you mentioned the peril that so many teenage girls are experiencing currently When a young person reaches a certain age, it's natural for them to differentiate. And sometimes, if not often, the communication suffers with the parent as a result because the kid is no longer interested in hanging out with the parent as much. They got their own thing. They want to shut the door to their bedroom and do their thing and and, and not be bothered. Um, So with this rise in mental health issues that young people are experiencing. What is the counsel to the parent who is in the middle of that situation where 
it's more challenging to connect and communicate with their young teen because that person, you know, they're not in the same place as when the kid was an adolescent, but also knowing there are all these threats out there and, you know, the risks are much higher in terms of the mental health conditions that we're seeing now. So there's so many things we talk about in the book. Attachment protects and you need to supervise your kids until their brain develops. I mean, you really need to understand normal development. Your prefrontal cortex, so the front third of your brain, largest in humans and any other animal by far, is not fully myelinated until you're about 25. And so we think of 18-year-olds as adults. It's ridiculous from a neuroscience standpoint. And the insurance industry actually knew this way before neuroscientists knew it. When do your insurance rates change? When you're 25. Mm -hmm. so they go down significantly because you make better decisions because you have more myelinated frontal lobes. And... Uh, Myelinization is really important. So when you're born, there's not much of it going on in your brain. About two months, the back of your brain becomes myelinated and you see better, which is why when you smile at a newborn, they don't smile back. But when they're about eight weeks old, you smile at them, they totally begin to connect with you. So myelinization, think of a copper wire or a neuron, a brain cell. Myelinization is it gets wrapped with the a white, fatty mm -hmm. substance, sort of like insulation on a copper wire. And that neuron works 10 to 100 times faster. And so your prefrontal cortex, the most human thoughtful part of you, is not fully myelinated till you're about 25. And so it's undergoing wild development from... 14 to 25, yet that's when many parents abdicate their role. And they like send kids off even though they're really not mature enough to go hang out with a bunch of other unmyelinated brains mm -hmm. that join sororities and fraternities and all sorts of bad things happen to kids then. I think we need to have supervision in a way, not that's intrusive, but it's like, I'm watching. I want to know where you are. I want to know when you're coming home. And kids hate it. But you know what? They hate it more if you don't do it, because that means you don't care. What's the counsel for the parent who's struggling to bridge that communication gap with the teenager who's like, leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you. Or how was your day? Fine. You know, the, the sort of navel gazing, you know, that kind of occurs around that age. Yeah, I think just try to be in their space as much as you can and be a good listener. There's always two words to default to, firm and kind. If you really understand the research, we talk about this in Raising Mentally Strong Kids, it's parents who are firm and loving do way better than parents who are loving and permissive. So permissiveness raises the most unhealthy children. Whether you're loving and permissive or hostile and permissive, permissiveness is not good. It's good to have boundaries and rules, and kids should have chores. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, and I would love for people to write down this statement, I only do nice things for people who treat me with respect. And too often, children will be very disrespectful, and then the parents will go out of their way to give them things because of their own guilt. I do nice things for people who treat me with respect, and I'm always nudging to have that time. And even if they reject you, I just keep coming back, but don't bend over and do all these nice things for people who are rude to you. That's not good. What is your counsel around devices? Clearly, some portion, probably a large portion of 
the depression, the suicidal ideation, et cetera, that's on the rise, particularly with teenage girls, is a result of, on some level, social media, the comparison that takes place, the 24-7 um, access to what your peer group is doing at all times, the bullying and criticism that occurs there. Parents, I think, are often confounded and confused about how to kind of manage that, like, the self is absorption. I mean, what social media leads to is a toxic level of it's about me. And my counsel is delay it as long as you can. I mean, like I would hold out as long as you could and then supervise it. And if you're paying for it, it's like, you know, you can have this, make sure they're parental um, security things on it because having eight-year-old boys exposed to pornography is a very bad thing for the developing brain. Talk about wearing out your pleasure centers. Um, so you need parental devices, delay it, and then if they have it, it's like you only can keep this if I have access to it. So I think it's really important to have supervision you have to be their frontal lobes until theirs develop because there's dangerous things out on mm -hmm. the web you get it as long as it's not a problem mm -hmm.